Hey everybody, uh, we are back for one last class uh, before Lord willing uh, my family and I get to go back to South Africa and we're we're going to, to wrap up everything by wrapping up uh, these lessons on the Holy Spirit. I know we didn't cover nearly everything uh, that uh, the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, but I hope that we, we've covered the sort of a broad overview of what the Bible tells us about who he is and the work that he does. And if you have a good grasp of what we talked about in the last two classes, you're likely to already be able to uh, see why certain misconceptions about the Holy Spirit are wrong. Uh, but we want to look at these in particular today because sometimes, you know, we, we get pointed to verses and and they're, they're telling us, no, this is what the Bible says. And if we haven't looked at these things before, then uh, we may not know how to answer those or, or know how to think about those things. So I want us to look at some of these ideas and some of the verses that are used uh, to make the points and uh, talk about what, what the problem is with these ideas and how they're using the scriptures. So... I want us to look first at, at the idea that the Spirit forces people to obey God. Now, I don't know that people, uh, these, uh, that most people would, would use the word forces, but that's really kind of what they mean. Either they, they would say that uh, the Holy Spirit changes someone from the inside to make them believe in God and, uh, and uh, you know, submit to His will or you know, it changes our heart, um, that, that the Holy Spirit directly, miraculously uh, takes away our desire to sin. Some people would say that. That's not really uh, perhaps more of a mainstream idea, but it's something that we've, we've certainly heard uh, from, from uh, certain people. And, and so that, that type of thing, that this idea that the Spirit actually forces people to obey God is a fairly common idea. Uh, and this is one of the passages, one of the main passages that is used, especially when we're talking about the Spirit changing us from the inside to allow us, at least, to, to come to Christ. Or, uh, and really, they, they would say, we, we have to because God is doing everything and we don't really have a choice in the matter. That's generally the idea. But in John 6, verse 44... Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So here Jesus says, you cannot come to him unless the Father who sent him draws us. We, we can't come to him, and therefore, this is the conclusion many people reach, is that this is talking about a miraculous uh, change through the Holy Spirit that the Father does to us in order to draw us to Christ. And unless the Father has chosen us and directly sends his Holy Spirit to us, uh, we cannot come to Christ. If you haven't heard that idea, just know it's, it's actually quite a, a common idea uh, among the denominational teachers. Uh, I don't know if everybody in those denominations understands that that's what is being taught, but it's the idea of Calvinism, and I'm sure others have a very similar idea. But here's the, the question. According to John 6, verse 44 and 45, how are we drawn to Christ? So we just read verse 44 here, but if, you, if you've looked at both of those verses, we'll look at both of them in just a second, but how are we drawn to Christ? where the Father has to draw us, but how? That's the question. The assumption is, so people read this and they make an assumption, they make an assumption that this is through a miraculous uh, change within our heart directly given by the Holy Spirit. All right, but Let's before we look at those verses together, while well, you can you can enter your your answer if you have one ready. In Matthew chapter sixteen, uh, remember uh, 
when Jesus is asking his disciples, who do the people say that I am? And then in, in verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And so some of these same teachers will take this verse and they'll say, you see, uh, the Holy Spirit directly revealed this to Peter uh, in a miraculous way where he just knew, <clears throat> he just knew that Jesus was the Christ. And that's why he says it was not revealed by flesh and blood, but my, by my Father who is in heaven. All right. But here's the, the problem with both of these things, there's an assumption made about how God is doing this. It doesn't tell us here how God revealed to Peter that Jesus is the Christ. But I think we have other passages that do uh, explain how the Father did this. Well, let's go back to John 6 and look, look at verse 45 along with it. We'll begin back in verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Well, but how do you hear and learn from the Father? And so that's the, the question. He says it's through teaching. That's how the Father draws us to Christ. But is this still a miraculous thing, right? It, well, here we have a little bit of a, a bigger idea of they shall be taught by God. But they, a lot of these people would still say, yes, but that's through direct revelation or direct knowledge, just knowing, just believing that, that that's a, something the Holy Spirit just puts into you. Uh, it's from the Father and and so that's what he means by hearing and learning from the Father. All right, well, let's, let's take a look at another passage here. We're going to look at John 5. And uh, let me go ahead and put this one in the comments. I know we're not spending a lot of time uh, on the questions uh, for you guys to answer, but if you have an answer, go ahead and put it in there. Mostly, I wanted you guys to think through these things, because if you, if you think through it yourself and you look at it ahead of time, uh, even before I point things out to you, it, it will help you remember these things and understand them much better. Uh, and that, that's always the case uh, in any study. If you, if you see it for yourself as you're, you're looking at things, then you're going to understand it better. You're going to remember it better. That's one reason Jesus taught a lot through questions. Uh, he, he asked people questions so they ca came to the conclusion on their own, and then it, it stuck with them, and they understood it properly. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, we're going to look here at John 5, verse 31 through 40, and the question is, how does the Father testify about Jesus? How does he teach? How do we hear and learn from the Father to be drawn to Christ? All right, let's begin here in verse 31. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. This is Jesus speaking. So he's saying, if I just tell you who I am, you, don't, you shouldn't believe that, right? Verse 32 there is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form, 
but you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me, that you may have life. There's a couple of different ideas here, but but the main thing here is that he, he says, okay, the scriptures testify of me. Okay, that's inspired by God, right? The Old Testament prophecies pointing to the Christ they talked about him, and he says, I'm doing exactly what the scripture said that Christ would do. But he, he, he says there in verse 36, this greater witness than John's. Now, John just told people Jesus is the Christ, and they had accepted John as a prophet, but they're doubting Jesus. Uh, but, but now he, he says, I have a greater testimony than that, the works which the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do bear witness of me. The things that he was doing that the scriptures prophesied that he would do, which included miraculous proof of him being from God, they testified of who he was. That was testimony from the Father. Uh, the, the, that, was, that was what Peter was seeing. That's what what he was putting together to realize who Jesus was. When Jesus says, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, that's saying, nobody just told you who I am, but you've understood it based on the evidence that the Father has given. Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies that were put there as evidence in the scriptures, and then the miracles that Jesus did to fulfill those prophecies were the evidence from the Father that Jesus is, in fact, the Christ. And that was drawing people to Jesus, if they would recognize the evidence that God gave. In John 10, verse 24 and 25, it says, Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Uh, Jesus says the things that he did were evidence enough that they shouldn't even have to ask him. It's not about what Jesus just claiming that he was the Christ. There were many people who claimed that they were the Christ. It's not just about somebody else saying, uh, this is the Christ. It's about Evidence from God. That's why no one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws him. Without the evidence given by the Father, through the works that Jesus did, the miracles, the fulfillment of prophecy, we could not come to Christ. We couldn't have this level of faith that we need to have to follow him. In Acts 14, verse 3, we have the same idea of the miracles being uh, this type of testimony. Uh, it says, Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. And again in Hebrews 2, verse 4, God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Here we have this, this idea of God testifying about the truth, which includes who Jesus is, with signs and wonders and miracles. This is, this is how the Father teaches. Uh, this is at least one way that, that he teaches who Jesus is and draws us to Christ. All right, so... Uh, the next question is, if you look at Hebrews chapter 10 and uh, verses 15 through 17, what is a way that the Holy Spirit testifies? Now, we know the Holy Spirit is involved in the testimony of uh, the miracles, right? The, the, that Jesus says that he did those things by power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the apostles and, and uh, others in, in uh, the first century church who were given this ability to, to perform miracles, they did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
But in Hebrews 10, verses 15 through 17, I want to know what, what is the way that the Holy Spirit testifies here. All right, let's look at that. In verse 15, it says, But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So in this case, he talks about the, the Holy Spirit witnessing to us. And the question is how? How does he witness to us in this case, at least? And we know there were also miracles uh, that the Holy Spirit used to, to uh, testify about the word being true. But here he's talking about the inspired word of God, isn't he? He's saying the Holy Spirit witnessed by saying. So this is what was written in the prophets in, in Jeremiah. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something Jeremiah spoke by the guidance, direct guidance and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so he says it was the Holy Spirit witnessing to us because he said, this is the covenant that I will make. And then he said, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. All right, so uh, this type of witnessing that he says the Holy Spirit is doing is through the word. It's through scripture. It's through uh, what, what is written down by his inspiration. And so when we read the Bible today, is the Holy Spirit witnessing to us? Absolutely. Uh, is, is that the Father teaching us? Absolutely. He sent the Holy Spirit. All right. So we, we have uh, this way in which we're told the Father draws us to Christ through the word, the word that is confirmed by the works that were done. All right. So there were fulfilled prophecies, but also miraculous things performed by power of the Holy Spirit, but this is the Father teaching us and drawing us to Christ. To say that there's any miraculous way, just a direct change in our heart, is a total assumption that the Bible says nothing about. But the, this is what the Bible actually does tell us about, that God testifies through the works that Jesus did, through the miracles his apostles did, through the word that was confirmed. That is their, the testimony that draws us to Christ. All right, so what about this idea? If the Holy Spirit directly changes people and, uh, and we're, you know, he, he just comes into your heart and changes you completely and, and, and makes you want to follow God and, and takes away temptation or anything like that. Can anybody resist the Holy Spirit? Okay, Brittany uh, has an answer to this one. She says, yes, not everyone who heard the message of the prophets accepted it. Acts 7 verse 51, spoken to the Jewish council by Stephen, who is full of the Holy Spirit, uh, according to verse 55, uh, talks about this idea. And that, that's right. Um, it's very clear that you can resist the Holy Spirit. And this is the verse that uh, Brittany was mentioning. Stephen said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. How could you resist the Holy Spirit if the way that he worked was to come into your heart and change you? You couldn't. You could not resist that. That That's not, it wouldn't make any sense. But if we understand that the Holy Spirit is giving evidence, he's giving the word of God, he's teaching you, this is the truth, this is what you need to do, and you say, no, I don't want to hear it, I'm not going to believe it, no matter what the evidence is, you're resisting the Holy Spirit, aren't you? All right, so... When we understand the way that the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit does his work, then it makes sense 
But if we, if we just make an assumption about how the Holy Spirit is working, that he comes directly into your heart and makes changes directly to you, then this doesn't make any sense. How could you resist the Holy Spirit? Surely you're not stronger than God. Uh, if he wants to change you directly, he'll change you, right? But if we're talking about him working through the word and through the evidence that it truly is the word of God and us refusing to accept it, then certainly we can resist the Holy Spirit. Mzwandile says, yes, we can resist when a person does not want to obey what the scripture says. And that's, that's exactly it. That's resisting the Holy Spirit. If you, if you say, I know the Bible says that, but I don't believe it. I, I believe this is better. You're resisting God. You're resisting the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, all that's going to lead to is your destruction, but, uh, and possibly others' destruction as well, if they follow you. But, uh, but we're, we can resist we can resist God. We can resist the Holy Spirit. God does not force us to obey him. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verses 4 through 8, um, it says, that, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God, but if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. He talks here about those who have known the word of God, been partakers of the Holy Spirit, he says, and yet they fall away. How could you fall away if being a partaker of the Holy Spirit meant that he's, he's controlling you and that whatever you do is, is from God? That's not how he's ever worked. And that's not how he's working today. But when we are saved, when we know the truth, we've seen the evidence, we've believed it, and then we say, you know what, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. How can anyone renew you to repentance? You already know the truth. What are they going to tell you? What are they going to show you? What evidence are they going to, to present? You already know. And so you can't be renewed to repentance. That doesn't mean that someone who has done this can never repent. Uh, they may eventually just realize, you know, what I am headed for destruction and what I'm doing is awful. I'm going to repent. But there's nothing that somebody else is going to tell them that's going to cause them to repent if they really know the word of God. Uh, but, but he's talking here about those that understand the truth, who, who, are partakers of the Holy Spirit. They've shared the heavenly gift. They've had salvation and they have fallen away and they're going to be cursed and burned because they're not bearing the fruit that should be borne by those who receive the rain, uh, the blessing of God and the, the truth that comes from him. In chapter 10 of Hebrews in verse 26, he says, for if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So he, he tells us here that 
Here's someone who's received the knowledge of the truth. Um, They were sanctified by the blood of Christ, and yet they're sinning willfully. Is that resisting the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. The Holy Spirit isn't going to make you sin. So if, if there's a sense in which the Holy Spirit is taking over us and making us uh, do what's right, well, he's failed here, hasn't he? But he's not going to fail. That's not how he works. All right, so I hope that it's clear that there is, there's no sense in which there's a miraculous taking over of the Christian or anybody else by the Holy Spirit in such a way that we just do what's right, we believe what's right, and, and uh, you know, we don't really have any control after that. Uh, that is not how the Holy Spirit has ever worked and never will work that way. He works through the Word of God. He's given the evidence. If we believe it, we must make our own decision to follow and, uh, and not go on sinning willfully after having received the knowledge of the truth. But here's a, the next one we're going to look at. And that's this idea that the Spirit gives us a feeling to testify about our salvation. All right, so uh, this this is mostly from Romans chapter 8, verse 16. So we're going to look at that. But um, in Romans 8, 16, it tells us that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So how does this happen? Um, if, you, if you look here at Romans 8, 16, it says the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the, this, is, this is where people get this idea that, well, I know I'm saved because the Spirit makes me understand that. I, I just, I feel saved. I have this feeling that comes over me. I'm sitting in, in the worship and, oh, I just, I just have this, this feeling of, of assurance and peace and I know I'm saved. And so that's the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. But is that what it says here? It It says nothing like that. That's another assumption that is made about how the Spirit does what he does, isn't it? Uh, If we back up and we look at the context, which is always important, and of course, even sometimes when people say, let's look at the context, they're still getting it wrong. Uh, I saw that a couple of times in looking at these these ideas about the Holy Spirit, where they said, look at the context, you see. Yeah, but you didn't look at the whole context. That's the problem. And I can do the same thing. So always check, always make sure that you understand what it's saying and not just rely on my explanation of it. Of course, that's, you know, I can be wrong too. But let's look at the context here, uh, because that is always important. Let's begin in verse 12. And he says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Well, how does the Spirit bear witness with our spirit? Well, I don't know that he explains exactly how the Spirit does that in, in this case. But but let's look at what he says about this in the context. He says, you're, you're debtors not to live according to the flesh, but to live according to the Spirit. He says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Now, how does the Spirit lead us? 
by the word that has been confirmed to be God's word, right? Through the scriptures. Uh, he leads us, he teaches us, and, and we have to make a decision to follow. But if we see that's what we're doing, we are in fact led by the Spirit of God. We're bearing the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. Right? We, we have this in our life. We see this. It's, it's, uh, we keep looking at the scriptures. We keep using it as the mirror, as James uh, describes it, to see how God sees us. Is the Spirit testifying with our spirit that we're children of God? Yes. If, if, if the scriptures say these are children of God who do this, who, are, who have this type of heart, who think in this way, and we look at that and we look at ourselves and we say, well, yes, that is what I'm doing. Then the Spirit is testifying with our spirit that we are children of God. But if we look at that and we say, well, I, I, don't, I don't like that part. Um, I'm not going to do that. Um, this part, I don't understand why I should have to do that. So, you know, I'm, I'm just not going to do that. But I feel saved. Is, is that the spirit testifying with our spirit that we're children of God? Not at all. Okay, we, we have to look at how the spirit bears witness through the word, through the confirmed word that he gave, that he confirmed. Uh, that is the only way that I know of that the scriptures actually tell us the spirit bears witness to anything. So I, if we just make an assumption that this has to do with some feeling that comes over us, where do you get that? Find, find anything like that in the scriptures. I, I don't know of anything like that. All right, we'll, we'll look at another passage that talks about peace, but, but we'll, we'll see what that's talking about when we get there. All right, but this doesn't say anything about a feeling. This is talking about if you're led by the Spirit of God, you will know, okay? You, you, will, you will have confidence that you are, in fact, a child of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 uh, in verse 9 through 13 says, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Okay, so what, what is the point of this? That, that here the, the Spirit is who knows the things of God. You're not going to figure out what God thinks on your own. So how do you know how God views you? The Spirit has revealed that, right? The Spirit has revealed that not through feelings, but through words. Uh, in verse 13, we speak these things in words that the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. All right, so this is how we are, are led to understand if we are children of God or not. And we can misunderstand the scriptures and think that we're saved, but if we're really honest and we're really looking at the scriptures and, and studying them over and over again, we can come to a knowledge of the truth, and we can be children of God by obeying it. Uh, and so, you know, there's there's not just an idea that if you if you feel saved, that means you're saved. That's not scriptural at all. In First John chapter two and verse twenty four through twenty nine, it says, "Therefore, let 
that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. All right, there's a number of things here, but I just want to look at a couple of, of things here. He's, he's saying there are things you've heard. There are things he's written. There are things that you're taught by the anointing that you have. Uh, and you know it's true. And then he says, here's what you know, that he is righteous. And if how do you know you're born of him? If you practice righteousness. Not through a feeling, but through the evidence of what you're doing in your life. Um, you can know that you are born of, of God. And now if we, we could talk about what this anointing is that teaches. I believe he's talking to people who had uh, the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in this time. Uh, others would say that the anointing is actually the word of God. And there's some arguments they make for that. Um, but either way, what we're coming down to is it's the what what we're relying on is the teaching that's from the Holy Spirit. Okay, either way it, it goes. This is we're we're talking about what's being taught. It's not about feelings. It's about teaching truth, what he what it has taught you, uh, and then you you will abide in Him by following what you are taught by the Holy Spirit, and how we today are taught by the Holy Spirit is through the scriptures, the written word of God. But some people would argue against that, right? Uh, there's this idea, it's very, very common, even among more conservative false teachers, um, they would they would still say that, that the Holy Spirit is still directly guiding each Christian with some sort of direct revelation. You know, sometimes they'll say they're not going to, they're not going to say anything contrary to the scriptures, right? The, the Holy Spirit's not going to say anything contrary to the scriptures. Uh, and he's not giving you a revelation that's intended for everyone. It's just for your life, like who you should marry or what job you should take or that sort of thing. You know, the Holy Spirit's going to reveal that to you. And uh, often they will connect this idea with inner peace, that that's how you know that this idea that you have is from the Holy Spirit because they, they know the Holy Spirit isn't talking to them with words. But, you know, if you get an idea, how do you know if that, if that idea is from you, from Satan, or from the Holy Spirit? And there's whole lessons that they, they build on this. How do you figure out uh, where that idea is coming from? I would argue that it's always from us, that ideas we get are always from us, not from Satan, not from the Holy Spirit. I don't believe Satan can put ideas in our mind. Uh, James I think makes that pretty clear that temptation comes from within, from what we want. Uh, what the Satan does is he he figures out what we like and he puts opportunities there. Or sometimes he's just guessing like he did with Job. He was totally wrong about what would affect Job. Uh, but anyway, I, I don't know anywhere that talks about Satan putting thoughts into our mind at all. Uh, I suppose we could say the Holy Spirit did in some sense through through the inspiration that he gave the, the men who wrote the scriptures and prophesied. I don't know how all that worked exactly, but they certainly knew the difference between their thoughts and the thoughts that were from the Holy Spirit. Well, 
today they it's kind of vague isn't it the way that people talk about it they say well you know if you have an idea uh, here here's one one of the the ones that here's from an article called four signs the holy spirit is speaking to you and this is this is just sort of representative of a lot of other ones that i read or or saw in people's sermons uh they say so if you're receiving a wise biblical plan so it, it agrees with with you know biblical principles and you have an inner peace it comes along with inner peace this is a sign the holy spirit is truly speaking to you all right so another uh preacher that i saw a sermon from he's a pretty popular writer uh but anyway he he was saying uh you also need to get confirmation from uh, from other believers. You know, you talk to them about it. And if they say, if they confirm the word by saying, well, that makes sense. I can see that. <laughs> then that's the Holy Spirit uh, confirming the word. I mean, that's just, I don't know. People, people just make up stuff, don't they? Um, this is, you, you can't find anything like that in the scriptures. But here they, they say, oh, if you have this inner peace uh, and it's a wise biblical plan, cause, well, what happens if you have that same feeling, that same inner peace, but it's a, about something that's the Holy Spirit has said you, you mustn't do? Yeah, well, then, then it's not the Holy Spirit, right? So what connection, where does that feeling of inner peace come from? Um Here's, here's where they're going to get it from, is from John 14. At least this is one of the, the places. They also mention the fruit of the Spirit, which mentions peace, along with many other things. I don't know why they wouldn't say joy or something like that, if you, if you're, if you have joy about it. I don't know. But, but they're going to get it mostly from John 14. But anyway, in John 14, verse 26, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would remind someone of some things. And I made this intentionally vague because if you just put it the way it is, it's kind of obvious. But anyway, who was he making the, this promise to? And how do you know? All right, so I think it's, it's pretty clear, even in just the immediate context when we look at this, but we're going to look at some other things in the context, the, the general context to, to see. But let's, let's look at this. In verse 26, he says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you and peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. All right, so uh, here's that connection with peace, right? So he says, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I've said to you. So here are some common things that are said about this. this he will teach you all things. That means... He's going to be revealing new things in your life about things you specifically need to do. Uh, perhaps some of them would just say this is only in relation to uh, maybe the kingdom work. So, you know, if you if you should go preach somewhere or whatever, but, uh, you know, he'll lay something on your heart. You know, that's a common expression people use. And I'm not saying that it's necessarily wrong to use that phrase, it depends on how you mean it. But uh, but anyway, he'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I've said to you. And they would say, well, that, that means you do need to study the scriptures. Uh, well, some people have a different idea about that, but most of them that I was looking at, they said, no, you do need to study the scriptures. But when you remember something that you've read, that's that's what this is talking about. This is talking about that's the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, when you when you're in a situation and a verse comes to mind, that's the Holy Spirit has reminded you of that. Of course, the problem one problem with that is a lot of times when people remember a verse in a situation, they're misusing the verse. That happens a lot. Uh, 
And the Holy Spirit isn't going to have them misuse a verse. All right. But then he says, peace, I leave with you. And so they say, you see, this is how you know when the Holy Spirit is, is teaching you or reminding you of something. You have this inner peace. All right. Um, so Mzwandile says uh, he made this promise to his apostles, those who had stayed with him, according to verse 25. All right. So I don't remember if I have verse 25 in here. I might. Uh, we'll see. And I'll, I'll come back to that one uh, otherwise. But I should have it, but I might not. All right, so he, but this peace that he gives, why, why is he telling his apostles that they're going to have peace? Because they're going to have a lot of trouble, right? They're going to have, and he says, this is not worldly peace. This is, you're going to have all kinds of problems that people in the world would be all upset about, but you don't have to be troubled or afraid because you're going to have the truth of God. You're going to know what's right. You don't have to worry about whether you're doing what's right or not, you'll know. And that's not through a feeling. It's because they'll have the revealed word of God. <clears throat> All right. Um, so um, I may not have it here. Let me just put it up here. All right. So John 14, verse 25. Um, All right. So Jesus said there, uh, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't have that one. But yes, that's that's important here in the immediate context, right? He's talking to people that he's with, that who have been with him in his presence. He's not talking to you and me. We were never there in his presence. But even when he says, in verse 26, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. It's not talking about things that you have read. He's talking about they have literally heard in his presence these things and the Holy Spirit is going to remind them of what he said. How, how is it that the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and even in, in some cases, John, when they talk about the same conversations and all, how is it that they're so similar? Of course, some people say, well, because they copied each other. But no, it's because they were all reminded of what Jesus said by the same Holy Spirit, right? All right, so we're, we're, we're looking here at, at uh, what, it, what the context is here. Who is he talking to? In, in verse... 26, he says, I'll bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. If you go to chapter 16, it's exactly the same conversation. You can look through, read read the whole thing from chapter 13 through 16 or through 17 and uh, see how all this is there at the same time. Uh, but here in, in verse 6, sorry, this is verse 1 of chapter 16. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Uh, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I, do not say, I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. All right. I don't think anybody is going to, to read this and say, well, that's talking to me today. Um, I'm not in the synagogues. I don't, I don't think any, any of us are going to be put out of the synagogues. Uh, but, but he's talking to his disciples in that time, those that he was with, because I was with you. All right. So that promise is not for us today. It is not it, it was only specifically for the apostles. That's who he was talking to. Now, we know there were others uh, who were also prophets and, and revealed the word of God besides the apostles. Uh, but that particular promise there in, in John 14 was to the apostles. 
uh, people that were with Jesus. But how does the Holy Spirit re reveal things to anyone? Okay, so let's talk about this idea of inner peace. That you just have an idea. And, uh, and you, if you have an idea and you have peace about it, then that's from the Holy Spirit. All right, how, is that how the Holy Spirit reveals things to people? Is that what the scriptures tell us? Do we get this uh, message through feelings, through peace, through just confidence about what we're, what we're thinking? All right, in Deuteronomy 4, in verse 19, they, they were told, And take heed, lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole he heaven as a heritage. Uh, not all translations put it exactly this way, but the New King James, I think, it, that's, this is the, the idea here at least. You feel driven, uh, or you're, you're motivated to worship them when you see... Uh, the, the sun, moon, and stars, and the, all the host of heaven. Uh, when you go out and you look up, now most of us, I don't think, are thinking that way, that, oh, look up at the stars and how beautiful it is. We should worship them. Uh, but this isn't a day when this was commonly done. Even today, some do this. Uh, but, you know, should you allow your feeling to decide if that's right or wrong? No, he said, that's, that's not what you must do. You mustn't follow your feelings here. And of course, the people saying that we're led by the Holy Spirit would also generally, generally say, oh, yeah, but, but that, that's not a biblical plan, right? That's not according to the scriptures. Uh, and so that's obviously not from the Holy Spirit. Of course, we have people today who say, well, you know, God is telling me I need to marry uh, multiple wives, uh, you know, or I need to divorce this wife and marry this one or whatever, right? This feelings, you know, I, I have this, this idea, I have the feeling, so it must be from God. Uh, there are certainly people that would make that argument, but that's not what we're supposed to do. And that's, that's not how the Holy Spirit works at all. Uh, Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. This isn't directly on here, but this is just the idea that feelings are useful only when we're in control of them. We are not to let our feelings control us or decide things for us. How the Holy Spirit reveals things is through words sometimes through dreams or visions, but they must be explained with words. Think about the dream that Pharaoh had, the two dreams. In Genesis 41, 16, uh, 15 and 16, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there's no one who can interpret it, but I've heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. All right, so, or a peaceable answer. So what, what is this idea here? He's, here's somebody who had a dream from God, but they didn't know what it meant. Same thing happened with Nebuchadnezzar. So how do they know what it means? They have to have an interpretation. But it, it's not just anyone who can interpret it. It's, it has to be a prophet of God, someone who... God is actually speaking through. Joseph says, I can't interpret it, but God can. And he's, he's going to, to tell me what this means. It wasn't through feelings. It was through words that, that this was interpreted and understood. But of course, this has ended, right? 1 Corinthians 13, we looked at this before, so we're not going to pay a lot of attention or a lot of time, to, uh, spend a lot of time on it today. But 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 13, talk about prophecies, tongues, and knowledge, this miraculous knowledge, going away. And uh, when, when the complete 
has come, the perfect has come, the parts will be done away. And so we've already looked at that, but, but that was going to come to an end. What, what Jesus promised to the apostles, and we see others also receiving uh, that gift as well, besides them, other prophets, but, but that was to come to an end. That was for a limited time. The whole truth was going to be revealed. He doesn't have to reveal to us who we need to marry. He's revealed to us what we need to consider in in deciding to marry someone. Uh, He doesn't have to tell us what job to take. He's told us what to consider in any job that we we do. He doesn't have to reveal those things to us. He leaves that up to us. All right, so here's a less common idea. Uh, but some people certainly have this. They don't need to study the Bible because they have the Holy Spirit, right? If we have the Holy Spirit, we don't have to study the Bible. Some Christians, I think, even have this idea, and they kind of wish for the days when when the Christians were directly led by the Holy Spirit, directly leading them, speaking through them, and didn't have to do all this study. Well, this is one of the passages that's used Uh, to talk about this idea that you don't have to study the Bible because everything's just put on your heart and you just know it. 2 Corinthians 3 verses 1 through 3. Do we begin again to commend ourselves or do we need as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. You see, the the message from the Holy Spirit is written on the heart, not on tablets of, of stone. But... Of course, they they are completely missing what he's talking about here. If they take this to to mean that the Holy Spirit is directly putting his message into people's hearts, he's saying, you are our epistle written in our hearts. He's saying, you are the letter of commendation because we taught you the gospel and the way you're behaving demonstrates that we taught you the truth, right? Right? Uh, clearly you're an epistle, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us. So we don't need letters of commendation to tell uh, to tell you that we are apostles of Christ, or I'm an apostle of Christ, that you should listen to us, that we're teaching the truth, because the, we taught you the truth in the beginning. And the way that you understand things, the way that you're living, is because of how we've taught you. So you are this epistle. It's not written on tablets of stone, but by the spirit of the living God on tablets of the heart. Because they're living what the spirit taught through Paul and the others who who were teaching them there in Corinth. All right, so this is just one of those passages that's really taken out of context. And if you keep reading, the, the main point of this passage is going to be that you know we, we don't need the Old Testament as law because that was a ministry of death. He's going to talk about those tablets of stone. Uh, but in Christ, we have liberty, but that's not liberty just to do whatever we want. It's talking about we have liberty from the law of Moses, from sin, from those things that the law of Moses could not deliver us from. But anyway, this is just, it's always, uh, if this is used to talk about the Holy Spirit putting something directly on our hearts, it's completely taken out of context. It doesn't say that. All right. Hebrews chapter 8 is another passage that's used in verses 10 and 11. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, know the Lord for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. This one is a lot better for them to use really 
because it says, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. So that's what it says, doesn't it? But what does it mean? The point of it is, it's a different covenant than what he had with Israel. With Israel, it was a national law that the priests were supposed to know it and teach it to the people, but very often they didn't. A lot of people didn't even know the law of God. Those that, that sort of knew it, they, maybe they knew a few things. We got to circumcise our children or whatever. You know, they, they, they didn't, they just did it because it was, well, that's the law. But he's saying here in this covenant, it's going to be a law in our hearts. It's, it's going to be something that if you're going to be in this kingdom, if you're going to be in this covenant, you're not going to be there because somebody else put you there. You're not physically born into this. You have to know God to get into this covenant. You have to understand things about him uh, in order to even submit to him as the king. And, and you, you have to enter into this covenant by choice. You have to have his laws in your mind and on your heart. That's the point. And yes, he does say, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. But how? Directly by the Holy Spirit? Well, we don't see that happening. We don't see that happening in the first century. We don't see that happening anytime. Uh, people that claim that they can just know the word of God without studying the Bible, when you test them, they do not know the word of God. Okay, the, it, it, it simply doesn't work. That's, and we don't see that in the scriptures. So what does it mean? Well, he, he motivates us, doesn't he? He's given us the law. He's given us his love. He's given us his son. Those that are in this covenant, what do we want to do? We want to know him. How do we know him? We know his laws. We know, we, we put them in our heart. And is he doing that? Absolutely. Okay. But not through a miraculous uh, way, but he's the one who motivates it. He gave his law. He, he's given us the motivation to learn. He's the one who is responsible for, for this, but we also have to make that decision for ourselves. We have to actually study. Uh, so uh, here's a, a question for you, and uh, you may think of other examples than what I have, so go ahead and answer this if you can think of one. But uh, can you think of any example of someone who was a prophet but still needed to study the written word? So think about that. If, if the Holy Spirit being in us means we don't have to study the written word, then there shouldn't ever be a prophet who had to study the word, right? All right, so Brittany gives an example that I didn't have in mind, which is a great one. Uh, although, I don't know if he's specifically uh, called a, a, a prophet, but let's, let's look at this. Okay, so Ez Brittany says Ezra in Ezra 7, verse 10. Um, and uh, so that says, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. And uh, the New American Standard, she says, says study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. So he was a skilled scribe in uh, the law of Moses. It tells us here in Ezra 7, verse 6. Um, and uh, Psalm 1 verse 2 describes any righteous man but fits Ezra well, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. All right, so I would say I, th I believe Ezra was a, a prophet. Um, if he wrote the book of Ezra, he certainly was a prophet, uh, but I, I'm not sure how strong of a case I could make for that. I, I don't know. I, I think he's generally regarded as a prophet. I'm not sure if the scriptures necessarily say he was a prophet, but certainly he was a righteous man. 
uh, who who studied the law of God, and uh, and so that that's a good example. I'm not sure if it's uh, super strong on whether he was a prophet or not. I'd I'd have to look at that a little closer. I was thinking of David. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, it says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. The Holy Spirit was always with David from this point. Okay, This is not he's coming and going. He's always with David. So uh, David then, he, he's a prophet of God. He wrote, uh, a number of the Psalms. We know he was inspired by God. It's mentioned in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit spoke through him. He was definitely a prophet of God. All right, so what about when he tried to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem? They put it on a cart, and that didn't turn out well. The oxen stumbled, and the Ark tipped, and Uzzah touched it and died. And so in 1 Chronicles 13, verse 12, David was afraid of God that day, saying, How can I bring the ark of God to me? He thought this was the way to do it. Let's bring it on a cart. But that's not the way to do it. The scriptures, the law of God, had specifically said how to transport the ark. How, why didn't David know that? He had the Holy Spirit. He was a prophet of God. Why should the Holy Spirit reveal that to him directly when he's already revealed it in the law? Okay, so later on in chapter 15 of First Chronicles 15, verse 2, then David said, no one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. How did he find that? How did he come to know that? Well, it doesn't say how. But I think we can be pretty pretty sure that he got that from the law. They went and they looked. How do you transport this thing? They should have looked before. They, they did it the first time, right? As it would have lived. But, but here, here's a prophet of God who still has to, to go and look at what the law said. Uh so just because he had the Holy Spirit and was a prophet does not mean that he didn't need to study the word of God. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 1 through 4, uh, it says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. But he's writing to Christians, right? He's writing to people who have the Holy Spirit in some sense. Uh, and I, I would think that they had prophets there in Ephesus. Paul had been there. I don't know why they wouldn't have had any prophets there in Ephesus. Uh, we know of some men that he gave the Holy Spirit to in Ephesus, but uh, so that they could have these miraculous gifts. So why do they need to read? Why does he have to write to them? He says, when you read it, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Just because people had the Holy Spirit in a miraculous way, in a prophetic way, that they, he, gave, he gave the gift of prophecy to people does not mean that he told them everything and made them understand everything. Uh, they, they still needed to study the word of God. In 1 Timothy 4 verse 13, he tells Timothy, who was a prophet, till I come, give attention to reading to exhortation, to doctrine. Well, why read? Well, this is public reading, right? He's reading to others. But why? If he's a prophet, why doesn't he just tell them? Because God has always used the written word to teach. There's no point in having it written down if he's going to continue revealing it all over again uh, to everybody. That, that's not how he works. 
Ephesians 2, verses 19 and 20. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. We're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Okay, They've laid a foundation given by the Holy Spirit, sent by Christ, but we don't have to keep building a foundation. What's been revealed has been revealed. He's not giving it to us all over again. There's a foundation that's been laid. We need to know it. We need to study it. We need to, to, to trust it so that we can build on it. Not building with new information, but building in our lives, obeying God and doing the things that he has already revealed through the apostles and prophets. All right, so here's a little bit more, I think, of a popular idea, even than that one. I know we're going over time, but this is our last class, so we'll, we'll just go ahead and finish everything out. Uh, but here's the, this idea that you do have to study you have to study the Bible, but you can't understand the Bible unless the Holy Spirit directly guides you. Uh, one illustration that, that I read was, you know, it's like having a flashlight with no batteries. You know, the Bible is that flashlight, but it's not, it's not going to do you any good unless the Holy Spirit is in you to light it up. Okay, so that's the idea a lot of people have. You, you do need to study the Bible, but you can't understand it unless the Holy Spirit directly guides you. And here's where they get this from. This is their, their main passage. 1 Corinthians 2.14 But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You see, if so... You can't receive the spirit, the things of the Spirit of God if you're the natural man, the one who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. And so you can't, you can't, you can read it, but it's foolishness to you. You can't know it because it's spiritually discerned. You have to have the Holy Spirit guiding you uh, miraculously in order to understand the word that he gave. All right, so let's look at the broader context. Uh, we've already read the first part. We don't really have to, to read all of that, but remember, he's talking about the words, right? He's, he's talking about, in verse 13, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive these things, all right, verse 15, but he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. But if you keep reading into chapter 3, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. Even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? What does he mean by the natural man and the spiritual man? Well, he's talking about the mindset, isn't he? These are people who have the Holy Spirit. That's very clear in 1 Corinthians. These people have the Holy Spirit. They're, they're prophets. They're, they can speak in tongues. They have all kinds of gifts of the Holy Spirit. You just go to chapter 12 and 13 and 14, and you see this. But he says, you are not spiritual people. So how can you have the Holy Spirit and not be a spiritual person? Because it's about your mindset. Are you focused on these physical things that, you know, I'm, I'm, I follow this preacher. That makes me better than you. 
Or are you actually focused on spiritual things? If you're not focused on spiritual ideas, you're not going to understand what the Holy Spirit teaches, right? You're not going to understand the Bible if you're approaching it from a physical mindset, from an earthly mindset, from a what can I get out of this for myself in this life mindset. You won't understand it. It's foolishness to you. Uh, but if you're approaching it from, you know what, I want to know God. I want to, to have a good relationship with him, do what pleases him. Can you understand it? Absolutely, you can understand it. Okay, it's about approaching it with the right mindset. This is not about whether the Holy Spirit is miraculously guiding you in your understanding. That's not what he's talking about here at all. Isaiah 11 verse 2 says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. This is another passage that is used. Uh, he, he talks about the spirit being the spirit of understanding. Therefore, you cannot understand if he's not directly giving you this understanding. So the question then is, well, how? How does the Spirit give understanding? How does the Holy Spirit give us understanding and knowledge and wisdom? How do we come to understand things? Isn't it? Don't we come to understand things by having them explained to us? The Holy Spirit does that, doesn't he? Through the Word. Okay. So, I'm not, I don't have any verses. To, we've already looked at plenty of verses that talk about that. It's just another assumption of how the Holy Spirit gives understanding. But we need to look at what the Bible says about it. Here's the last point. Uh, and uh, this is another pretty common idea, wrong idea about the Holy Spirit, that we need to ask God to give us the Holy Spirit. Uh, so this is the idea of praying for the Holy Spirit. Um, and so I have uh, this final question, which is when you look at all the examples of people receiving the Holy Spirit, can you find any case of them receiving him through prayer? And uh, you might. It depends on how you look at it, uh, at that, that question. Uh, but... But I, 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 I'm asking, can you, can you think of any example where people prayed for the Holy Spirit to come upon them? And he did. All right, let's, let's look at uh, the main passage that's used to talk about this. In Luke 11, verse 13, Jesus says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Well, there you go. You need to ask God for the Holy Spirit. But is that really what he's talking about here? In the context of Luke chapter 11, he's, he's healing people. He's, he's doing miraculous things for people. To, to benefit them. In Matthew chapter 7, we have a parallel, although it looks like a different context, but really the same thing being said. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Well, what are those good things? In the context of Matthew 7, he's talking about people who are desiring to know the word of God. Seek and you will find. Uh, he talked about don't cast pearls before swine. Those are people that don't care, but you need to be seeking. You need to understand the value of the word of God and be seeking it. Well, where, do, where does the word of God come from? Where did the, that miraculous proof of the word of God that Jesus was, was doing there in Luke 11 come from? From the Holy Spirit, all right? I don't believe here he's talking about the Father giving the Holy Spirit in some kind of miraculous way to someone for them to be able to do these things. He's talking about what the Holy Spirit does for us. What, 
what does he do for us? He 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 provides the word of God. That's the context of Matthew seven, and he proves it. That's the context of Luke chapter eleven. He's proving that this what Jesus is doing is or, or teaching and who he is really is from God. And so, uh, I know the wording here is a little bit difficult, as many things are in what Jesus taught. But when you look at the context, it seems like what he's dealing with is actually the the things that are from the Holy Spirit that benefit us, which is the word of God and proving that it's his word so that we can have confidence in it. We, if, if they came to Jesus for a miracle, did he ever turn them away? Never, right? Uh, and when, when we come to him for the word, it's there, isn't it? It's confirmed. It's given. It's there in the word, in the, in the Bible. We can open it up, but if we're not seeking, we're not going to find, right? We're not going to, to be looking for it and we'll never find it. But if you're, if you're looking for it, if you're asking God for it, you're going to find it. And that's from the Holy Spirit. He gave the word, he confirmed it. And that's why we have it today in our Bibles. All right. But if we look at the examples of people receiving the Holy Spirit in a miraculous way in Acts 1, verse 4 and 5, uh, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. They weren't asking for the Holy Spirit. Jesus just says, you wait and he's going to come to you. This is a promise from the Father. In Acts chapter 10, uh, with Cornelius and his household, in verse 44 and 45, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Well, <laughs> were they asking, were they praying for the Holy Spirit to come? That, not at all. Peter was still busy preaching the word to them. They were busy listening, but the Holy Spirit just came to them to prove that they could be acceptable in the kingdom, and then they were baptized into Christ. In Acts 19, uh, this is the example there in Ephesus of some who did receive these gifts of the Holy Spirit. In verse 1 through 7, it says, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, notice they're not asking for the Holy Spirit. He's asking, Do you ha Have you received the Holy Spirit? because he wants to give him to them uh, if uh, they have not. So they said to him, we have not so much heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. <clears throat> then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. <clears throat> when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. There's no, no praying for the Holy Spirit to come here, is there? Now in Acts chapter 8, we do find the apostles, Peter and John, praying before they laid hands on people to give them the Holy Spirit there in Samaria. That's why I said you might be able to, to make that a case where there was prayer involved uh, in the Holy Spirit uh, coming to people, but it's not. it wasn't the people asking for this to happen. It was a recognition by the apostles that they need this, and so they were going to, to give the Holy Spirit to them. Uh, in, in Romans chapter 8, this is not, I believe, I don't believe this is talking about a miraculous sense of the Holy Spirit uh, doing anything miraculous with us. But if we, uh, 
Sorry about my, my camera is freezing up, it looks like. But anyway, just ignore that. All right, but he, he's talking here about the sense in which all Christians have the Holy Spirit. And he says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So he's, he's telling us here that all Christians have the Holy Spirit in some sense. I believe we've, we've talked about this already, that this is talking about the way we live according to the teaching of the Spirit that demonstrates the Spirit being in us. But again, this doesn't happen through prayer, does it? This isn't something where you, you're in Christ and, and you belong to Him and then you pray for the Holy Spirit to come. This is talking about something that is true of all who belong to Christ. We, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. There, you don't have to pray for the Holy Spirit to come. All right. So anyway, I know we went uh, pretty far over time, but I wanted to, to finish that up. And there may be some other misconceptions about the Holy Spirit, but those are, I think, cover a lot of the, the broad ideas. Sorry, my uh, camera is really off now and lagging with the audio, but anyway. So this is the end of our classes, at least for a while. Uh, we're, we're going to, uh, to be uh, celebrating Thanksgiving in America on Thursday. And uh, so we're not going to do a class then. And then after that, we're getting ready for our, uh, our trip to South Africa. And when we get back to South Africa, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do these anymore from there. We'll, we'll have to see how it works out, but uh, it'll be a while at least before we have any other classes if we do have some. All right, so let's go ahead and say a prayer and uh, then we will be finished. Our Holy Father, we're so thankful that you've blessed us with health and life and that you've given us everything that we need to please you, that we can look to your word and have confidence in it, that the Holy Spirit has done his job perfectly and continues to do his job perfectly, as you all do. We pray, Father, that we would have confidence in your word, that we would live our lives the way that you've taught us to live, that we would truly be your children, that we would live in righteousness, and that we would know and have confidence in our relationship with you. We pray, Father, that you would be with those that are sick, that uh, are having all kinds of, of problems. We pray that you'll heal them, but we also pray for those that are traveling and for the upcoming trip that we have, uh, that everything will go well. We pray, Father, that you'll be with all those laboring in your vineyard, in the kingdom, that you would bless us with strength, but that we would be, um, be true to you and to your son, that we would never compromise truth, but that we, we would speak the word in love, speak the truth in love, and help others to grow, help us to grow, and be even better servants for you. We pray, Father, that you would uh, give us all uh, good health, but especially help us to be good examples and lights in the world as we uh, live among those that do not know you. Help us to lead them to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really, really do appreciate everybody who's participated 
who's helped uh, with uh, uh, answering questions and even asking questions from time to time and uh, who has uh, really uh, been uh, regular <laughs> students. That's been, been very encouraging to me. And I hope that you certainly keep up your studies. And if I can help you in any way, you can reach out to me. Uh, but uh, anyway, God bless you. And I hope Hope that everything goes really well for you. And for those in South Africa, Lord willing, I'll be seeing you before too long. Bye.